Good morning, conference. Before I start, I wanted to explain what is companion cropping and intercropping. The simplest thing, way to explain it is it's planting two or more crops in the field at the same time, and one of them you take to harvest at least. Now, natural ecosystems produce high amounts of biomass with no artificial inputs using a high genetic diversity of plants. 5,000 years ago, Native American farmers realized this principle and designed their farming system around this principle. And the first known intercrop is called the Three Sisters. It consists of maize, which grows fast, beans, which use the maize as a trellis, and in the bottom is squash, which acts as a weed mulch. So why, 5,000 years later, do we grow fields of genetically identical crops, prone to the same diseases, prone to the same insect pests, prone to the same weeds, and using large amounts of inputs to produce a crop? Have we learned anything in 5,000 years? <clears throat> if we want to produce low input costs, low input crops, with high outputs, we need to look at our native flora and fauna. This, if I wasn't on my farm, is what it would look like, deciduous woodland. If you look at this picture, there's large, there's large plants, there's small plants, there's perennial plants, there's annual plants, there's broad leaves. There's a wide range of crops and plants on the same area. What this is doing is utilizing every niche available above and below ground, utilizing all resources available. To understand how intercropping works and will work, we need to follow this principle. So how do we do it? The simplest way, which isn't technically intercropping, is variety mixtures. So instead of planting one variety of, say, wheat on your farm, plant four varieties. They have different, they'll have different disease ratios, disease, prone to different diseases. What this will do will stabilize your yield and mean you'll need less fungicides in that crop. And the next stage on from this is having a wheat crop, which has already been developed in the UK, where every plant is genetically, genetically different. This is already available in the UK. The next one is relay cropping. In southern climates, they have chances for two harvests per year because their growing season is longer. In northern climates, this has been thought not to be possible, but it is. If you overlap the growing season of two crops, you can get two harvests. This is a picture of a farmer I met in Suffolk who had planted buckwheat into his standing oat crop with his drill so that when he harvested his oats, his buckwheat was already growing in attempt to harvest buckwheat. I also saw this in Canada with soybeans and wheat. This is a field of wheat on my own farm. With this wheat, I have planted radish, lentils, and buckwheat. <clears throat> the idea for the radish came from the States. It scavenges nutrients, holds on to that nutrients, and in the spring, when it dies, it releases that nutrient back to the wheat as a fertilizer. In China, they had done intercropping with wheat with garlic, and in India, with mint. And the idea of garlic and mint is the volatiles produce deter aphids. And with pyrethroids becoming resistant in the UK and around the world, this is a potential technique for us to, to reduce the aphid problem in our wheat. Full season intercropping. This is a picture courtesy of Gordon Whiteford, my fellow scholar, and you saw, saw some of it yesterday. What he has done is planted spring wheat and spring peas, planted on the same day and harvested the same day, but shut the gate in between. What he has done is used two crops using, utilizing different nutrients, different growth habits to produce two crops from one field and a similar yield to, to the monocrops. Under sowing is possibly the best known form of intercropping in the UK. Um, we've known under sowing spring cereals with clovers and grasses, an old technique. But I wanted to highlight under sowing of maize. The rapid expansion of maize growing in the UK due to aero anaerobic digestion, for me, is a rapid expansion of bad farming. The, the fields are ploughed before the maize, 
The maize is planted in May, is in the field for five months, and then is harvested normally in the wet, and the field is bare over winter again. This causes large amount of soil erosion and nutrient leaching, and is a PR disaster for UK farming. There is one simple method that can help mitigate these things, and this is a picture from the UK, so it can be in the UK, thanks to Kate Speak Adams, is planting legumes and grasses when the maize is about knee high into the crop. And what this does is hold on to the nutrients, it stops the harvesters compacting the ground at harvest, and also means there's a green cover over winter to prevent soil erosion. And it can also be used for animal fodder. I met this guy in France, <clears throat> and what he is doing is using a perennial crop underneath his annual crop. So he grows lucerne for four years, and on that lucerne he'll have two wheats, a peas, and an oilseed rape. He has managed, using this technique, to harvest fertilizer costs and grow wheat without fungicide and get the same yield as his conventionally grown crops. And that is saving him 140 euros per hectare in growing costs. This is a chap from Australia who I didn't see, but I wanted to include it in my presentation. He is planting an annual crop into his permanent pasture. His permanent pasture is a warm season pasture. So what he is doing when the warm season pasture is dormant in the late winter, early spring, he plants a cool season crop like oats. The oats manage to get away from the pasture and don't get, don't have, doesn't have competition. So he managed to, every four years, he gets an annual crop off his permanent pasture without killing his permanent pasture. And the other added benefit is that his, the growth of his permanent pasture the following year is better. Agroforestry. This is from Peterborough, a fellow Nuffield scholar, Stephen Briggs. So he has apple trees in his arable fields. Why has he done this? His soil is prone to wind erosion, prone to nutrient leaching. So planting apple trees has reduced wind erosion and nutrient leaching and has also added 10% to his production, increased, spread his workload and added diversity of income. The longer I was on my Nuffield tra travels, the more I realised we need to get more trees back onto our arable farms and our livestock farms if we're going to want to be sustainable in the future. So why bother? Why make it things difficult? Why intercrop? Why plant maize every six metres and soybeans in between? Well, this chap did it because it earned him more money. The first one is fewer weeds. This is an intercrop I grew on my farm this year of oats, linseed and buckwheat. And next door, I grew oats and linseed. The only difference is that this one had no herbicide, and the other one had herbicide, and there was the same weed burden in both. What was happening is that the third part of the intercrop was filling that niche that the weed would have filled if I hadn't put it in. Fewer insect pests. This is a sunflower crop in Kansas. This chap planted 14 companion plants, different species of companion plants, with his sunflower crop. And he grew sunflowers without fertilizer, without insecticides, which for sunflower is pretty impressive, and got higher yields in his monocrops. And the following year, he grew triticale without fertilizer and without the need for pesticides. So it's not just the one year that the intercrop is there, you get a benefit in the following years. Less disease. Another guy I met in Saskatchewan, he is growing chickpeas and flax. Chickpeas in Canada is a very high risk break crop. In a wet year, it may need eight fungicide passes. By intercropping with flax, he'd reduce that to one or two. What is happening is the flax is acting as a disease barrier and not affect, so the disease is not spreading through his chickpeas. So he has turned a highly high-risk crop like chickpeas into a highly profitable crop. Fewer inputs. None of us like writing checks. This is one technique to reduce that, which in turn leads to more profit, keeping the bank manager happy. 
So why aren't we all doing it? Well, for me, the biggest barrier to uptake is that we have been brainwashed for the last 60, 70 years that monocropping is the only possible way of doing things. We need to open our minds, take that out, and throw it in the bin. The limits to intercropping is our own imaginations. There are so many different combinations available for your farm, for my farm. There's nowhere that it is not possible. So my take home messages. On average, there's a the potential to produce 30% more yield with intercropping with less inputs. Is there another technique anyone knows of that can do that? But it is a management and knowledge intensive process. It needs to be well planned. You can't just go out and do it and expect it to work. What works on my farm won't necessarily work on your farm. What works on one of my fields won't necessarily work on another field. You need to tailor it to your situation. And for me, one of the key things is farmers, if we want research done for us that is going to benefit us, we need to start paying for it. Whether it's through levy boards or farmers groups getting together and speaking to researchers, we need to pay for it ourselves. We cannot expect to get the right answers from a top-down approach. It starts at the bottom, and that's with us. So the, the title of my study was the potential for intercropping and companion cropping in the UK. And the answer is, it is huge. And I don't believe it's just in the arable sector, fruit, veg, horticulture, potatoes, livestock can all benefit from intercropping. So I'd like to say a few thank yous. Um, first, thank you to my sponsors for the last two years. They've been fantastic. I've had great interaction and made some friends at the HDB Cereals and Oil Seeds. Second one to Mike and Poey and their team. All the Nuffle Scholars will agree with me. They do a fantastic job and they are real great support. Third is to my parents who've looked after the farm in my absence while I'm gallivanting around the world. And the, the last biggest thank you is to Philippa, my other half. Two days before my Nuffield interview, she gave birth. And it's been a, she's been a Nuffield widow ever since. Um, but thank you.